My name's uh, Jim Freeman. I'm a lawyer. I uh, have been a trial attorney for about 17 years now. And um, I initially started as a uh, plaintiff's attorney and worked for people who were injured. And then I uh, went and worked as a defense attorney for a few years and worked for a big law firm for insurance companies. And um, the stars sort of aligned, and I realized at one point that I was going to be able to leave the defense firm and uh, go on my own. So um, I decided to quit the firm. What happened was I went on vacation and um, went on a family vacation, and I realized that all my nieces and nephews had grown up, and I had basically missed it. And this was the rest of my life that I was looking at. You know, you're making great money and everything, but at what, at what cost to you? And you only get to live once. So um, I uh, burnt out on that three weeks of vacation where I realized that I burnt out of my job. And I uh, came back, and I was growing a beard. And everybody says, what's with the beard? And I was like, I quit. Um, so I quit my job. And I thought I would have a regular plaintiff's practice like uh, everybody else that I knew who went out and started their own shop and represented people who were injured. Um, and to me, this meant that I would go around to other people that I knew in the practice of law and I would ask them to refer me cases that they didn't want to work on or things like that. Um, and um, I had one case, my secretary gave me a case from her sister who had been in a car wreck. Um, and it was fine, but you know it takes a while to. If you if a case comes in today, it may take two years. It may take four years to for that case to resolve. So um, I didn't have a lot to do with my time, and um, so I went into a buddy of mine's bike shop and I asked him for a job. And he uh, looked at me and he says, "Well, aren't you a lawyer?" And I said, <laughs> "I am, but." Uh, um, What's that? Don't tell anybody. Yeah, not really. I was stoked about it. I just thought it was great. Like I, I'm gonna be able, I'm gonna be able to be a bike mechanic. And he gave me a job reluctantly and started on weekends. And then I turned out to be awesome, as I said I was gonna be. You know, what what overqualified bicycle mechanic can you have? But a guy who went to law school, right? Um, and um, so there I was working at the bike shop as a mechanic and a. Guy came in with his arm in a cast in a mangled bike, and I said, "What happened?" And you know, he wanted an estimate on his bike, and we shook hands. We kind of got to talking. And the next thing you know, I had my first case, and it was a broken arm, and it was my own case that I had generated, and this was a, a significant thing to me because um, it's it's hard to generate business as a personal injury attorney. That's the hardest thing. So if you can do that, you kind of overcome everything else. Um, so at this point, you know, for years I had been a year-round bicycle commuter, and I had uh, I, I raced and all sorts of other stuff. So I was very entrenched in the community already at this point. And they called me Lawyer Jim because I just Lawyer Jim's going to start the race off of blah blah blah, um, and that was just my my moniker because um, just because I was a lawyer, not that you know they knew anything else about me, but. Um, so I started going around to my buddy's bike shops and dropping off cases of beer and, you know, Pabst Blue Ribbon and um, telling them that um, this is this thing that I, I'm going to start doing and I just want everybody to know. And one thing led to another and six years later I had a, uh, not even six years, it was like two years. It was even later that year. I just knew that I had already developed the business that I was going to be able to, um, I was going to be able to make it. So there was a period of time there where I describe it like a big airplane, like coming down, my financial situation, and then um, just knowing that I had the cases and I just had to hold out long enough to make it. So um, that was in 2006. So now we're 11 years later, and um, now I've got. Uh, we've got two offices, one in Chicago and uh, one in Fairfield. 
Uh, the Fairfield office opened three years ago, uh, moved to our current location about a year ago, uh, permanent location now. So I, I bought the building. Um, so we'll be there for the long haul. And um, got two, two partners, um, an associate, and two paralegals. And at any given time, we have about 200 cases. And they are almost exclusively bicycle cases. We have a minority of um, pedestrian cases that we also handle. Um, but most of what we are doing, what we are known for, is the bicycle stuff. So for me, it's kind of a dream come true. I tell people I get to immerse myself in my hobby uh, for a living. And uh, uh, everybody who works for me is pretty much the same way. My paralegal, Bob, who's been with me for the long haul, who my joke about him is that he's the closest thing I ever had to true love. And when he dies, I'm just going to have to retire. Um, and my wife hates it when I say that. <laughs> um, but Bob uh, founded the Chicagoland Folding Bike Society, and uh, he um, was on the board of a bunch of other bike clubs and all sorts of stuff. So very involved in the community, old school. Um, my paralegal, Ann, is uh, uh, very active in, um, in the community as well. She was on the uh, board of directors for the Active Transportation Alliance and um, Women, Women Bike Chicago and a few other things. Um, so, my partner Brendan, who I brought on four years ago, next month, um, and I kind of absorbed his law firm, which was just him. Uh, he um, he was kind of my competition, and um, I reached this point where I just had too much work, and then I realized, wow, it's like I'm back at the law firm. Um, you know, and I'd work until 8, 9 o'clock every night, and this is my life again. So I brought him on to sort of relieve some of that pressure, and it's been good for both of us. And we, uh, everybody enjoys working for our clients. Um, so what I usually do is I talk about the typical things that I see in my practice. And I, I usually start by uh, making it clear to everybody that I see the worst of the worst when it comes to this stuff. Uh, everybody I talk to, and I've got counterparts all over the country that um, I'm, I'm part of the Bike Law Network, uh, which is a network of bicycle attorneys that was started a few years ago. And um, basically, it's comprised of people who have uh, bicycle focused practices. But as far as we can tell, there's nobody that's got one like us, where it's just that's basically all that we do. Um, and we've seen it all. We get lots of requests from other people in other parts of the country. You know, when you when this happens or when that happens, um, you know, what do you do in this situation? Have you ever had this come up? Um, so I did a continuing legal education conference once with other people who had claimed to be um, have some expertise in bicycle cases. And I remember one of them kept talking about this case. He had one case he talked about where. Um, a person was riding a stationary bicycle in a gym and the pedal fall off and they fell over and they were injured as a result of it. And he talked about this case like four times, five times during the course of this uh, continuing legal education conference. And at some point I realized like, this is it. He's got one bicycle case and it was a guy who was riding indoors. Uh, so that was pretty funny. So um, at, at any rate, um, as far as I can tell, there's nobody else. Maybe there's a guy out in California, Gary Bruston, who's who's got a practice like ours, but nobody else really does this stuff as exclusively as we do. So as I tell people that, I tell you honestly, I see the worst of the worst when it comes to this stuff. And I will tell you, bicycling is actually a very safe way to get around. Um, and statistically speaking, that is the case per mile bike. Uh, You're actually safer riding a bike than you are doing a lot of other things. Uh, so I always start out my presentations with that because now I'm going to talk about when bad things do happen, what does it tend to be, and what can you do to avoid it? Um, so a couple things I noticed. One is there are differences in uh, collisions that you see in urban areas versus rural areas. Uh, in urban areas, uh, far and away, uh, the two most popular collisions 
are uh, a left cross and Dorans. And that is about two thirds of our practice in any given dense urban area. So here I'm thinking like Des Moines or Chicago, uh, places like that. Are you, are, you, are you going to explain those? Left cross? I don't know what there we come. No, I didn't catch the second one. Uh, Doring. So uh, left cross is a situation where you're, you're riding down the street. There's a car approaching from the opposite direction. That car makes a left turn. And they either make the left turn into the path of the person or the bicyclist. Um, this is, regardless of where you're at in the United States, as far as I can tell, this is one third of all bicycle auto collisions. It's just a real popular thing. So um, I always describe it like kind of falling off a log. Those are real easy, especially if it's an open intersection. Clearly, you're an automobile as far as the law is concerned. So they should yield to your right of way before executing their left turn. Um, the only problem we run into with those, as with a lot of these, is lack of proper lighting equipment at night. Uh, so the law in Iowa is white headlight, red rear reflector, uh, and they give you the option of a red light instead of the reflector. But what happens is, uh, and we'll talk about this a little bit more down the line, but what happens is a um, person says, you know, they didn't have this light that they were required to have by law. And I, I looked, and I didn't see them. And then I executed my turn. And you wouldn't drive a car without headlights, right? And that's actually a defense that appeals to juries. So uh, it is a defense that I consider to be effective in a lot of these instances. So the second most popular collision in urban areas, which is not as popular in Iowa, admittedly, as it is in Illinois. Um, I'm licensed in three states, Missouri, Iowa, and Illinois. Um, and that's the Doring. So this is. This is where you're riding your bicycle down the street and a car opens the park door into your path or into your person and um, a collision ensues. Um, in Chicago, literally, this is one out of every three collisions. It's just real, real popular one. Um, and you see it in communities where they stripe bicycle lanes adjacent to a parking lane. So. When I see those, I'm always like, Lawyer Jim gives those a thumbs down. Um, at the same time, sometimes there are constraints that they have. So there's just no choices where to put things. And I like having on-street infrastructure for bicycles personally. Um, other people have differences of opinions about it, which I respect. Um, but when you put the bike lane right next to the parking lane, you're going to have these types of interactions. Uh, what I tell people is, if you first and foremost, if you're going to ride adjacent to uh, a line of parked cars, you want to try to stay out of the door zone. It's that zone where they can flip the door open and, and catch you with it. If you have to ride into the door zone, I kind of bat my hand just like this as I go by. Um, and I've had probably three times that a door has popped open in my hand and I've slammed it in somebody's face. And it is always a uh, very rewarding experience. Um, <laughs> So that's, you know, there are other strategies you can employ. You can look in the, uh, the, the mirrors to see if you see anybody. You can look through the car if you can see if they don't have tinted windows. Uh, but I will tell you, those uh, are not foolproof. So if you have to ride in the door zone, you want to do this thing that I suggest you do because I had a case where somebody was leaned over uh, getting something off the floorboards of the passenger seat. The cyclist had checked everything, you know, the mirrors looked in the windows and didn't see anyone, and then boom, kicked the door open. Um, so somebody got door. Maybe you're going to mention this. Is the driver that opened the car door liable? Uh, this is another one of these cases, kind of like falling off a log. There are statutes against uh, opening your door into traffic. So if somebody opens, your, opens their door um, and a car drives by and rips the door off, Guess what? The person who opened the door is responsible for the damage to the car that, that ripped their door off. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that. It's true, but that is the case. Um, the only defense that, with the dooring, the only defense that I found effective is there are two. Uh, one is 
the effective one, which is lack of headlight, lack of pro proper lighting equipment. Um, so if you don't have that, it's like, this is what they'll do. They'll say, oh, I looked, and I didn't see anything, and then I opened my door, and there was this ninja biker with no lights on. Um, so that's going to be effective in that instance. Um, the other thing is passing on the right. If what happens is a bicyclist will filter up between uh, traffic stopped at a light and a line of parked cars, and uh, somebody will open their door as the bicyclist is filtering up, and then they say, oh, well, you're overtaking on the right. You're supposed to overtake on the left. So this is a thing that we see here in Iowa. In Illinois, actually, the legislative changes that we've been involved in, um, we actually got that law changed. So in Illinois, the law reads now, as of about three years ago, um, you can, uh, you can, a bicyclist can pass on the, can overtake on the left, or they can overtake on the right as long as it's safe, is what the law reads, which is sort of inspecific, but it gives us enough that it's been good for our clients. Um, what happened with that was I saw this over and over and over where a bicyclist would overtake on the right, and uh, I started talking to the um, organizations that do the lobbying for bicyclists in Illinois, and um, I was saying to them, this is a thing that I see. Um, we should do something to change this. And um, nobody listens to me. Nobody listens. Who is, what would I know? You know, nobody listens to me. What happened was the assistant director of the Active Transportation Alliance was eight months pregnant, and she was riding down the street, and she was filtering through traffic, and she got doored. And the cop showed up, and he gave her a ticket for passing on the right. And I remember she came down. She sat at my conference room table, and as I was having the intake with her and signing her up, and I looked across the table at her, and I said, I'm so glad this happened to you. Uh, because then they listened to me. And you know what? Six months later, we got the law changed. And everybody had to admit, yeah, <laughs> you were right. Um, so that's something that in the future I may uh, press the Iowa Bicycle Coalition to work on in Iowa. It's not super pressing because there just aren't a lot of places where doorings are a big issue here. Uh, but it does happen. So um, it's, it's a question of whether an, we only have so much legislative gold to spend. Do we want to spend it on a thing that doesn't happen that much, even though it's probably a problem for some people? Um, my view is we currently have other things that are much more important to a lot of people. Um, so that's why I haven't been pressing it in Iowa yet. Um, less common than the left cross and the dooring then are all of the rest of the accidents or collisions that we see, interactions with bicyclists and motorists uh, in urban areas. So we've got the right hook. You're traveling down the road, a car either overtakes you or you kind of ride in tandem with them, and they make a right turn into your path or person. So that's what we call the right hook. Um, the thing that I have noticed that is an Iowa-specific thing is um, in central Iowa, and I haven't got very many calls about these from this area, but in Des Moines, Cedar Rapids, where they have this great network of trails, um, I get a lot of calls about right hooks or right turners striking bicyclists who are crossing a street on a trail. That's a popular thing. And usually they're making a right turn on red, and the bicyclist has a walk signal or a cross signal, and they start to, they come out in the street to cross, and the driver making the right turn on red is looking for traffic coming this way, and they strike the bicyclist. And that's a real popular thing. Um, the other thing that I see in that area that I haven't gotten so many calls about from here, even though we do have a, a fair network of bicycle trails in Johnson County. Um, more from the Des Moines area, what I've gotten a lot of calls about is bike-on-bike uh, -bike collisions on trails, especially in real nice days. And I think this is a capacity issue. And the thing that bothers me about it is um, we're not tracking it. So we don't know how much is happening. But I know, because I'm getting the calls, that it's happening actually a lot. And usually, um, 
if I give a presentation in, in that area, I'll, I'll say, so who here has seen an instance where uh, two bicyclists or a bicyclist and a pedestrian have almost collided on a trail, like on a nice warm day, and pretty much everybody's like, uh, and I've seen it too. So uh, that means it's happening a lot, um, and we're not tracking it, so that's, that's a problem. Um, Mark knows about it, so you know, hopefully it's something that we're going to deal with in the future, but right now I know it's happening more than anybody really believes. So then we've got collisions in urban areas, or in uh, rural areas. In rural areas, the left cross is far and away the, the most popular collision. Uh, you see a lot of overtaking collisions. Uh, so a motorist is overtaking a bicyclist, and in the course of doing that, there's some collision ensues. Usually they're passing too close, is my experience. Um, one thing I talk about at this point usually is the danger of riding your bicycle into the sun either um, in the morning or in the evening. Um, and actually, Mark Wyatt and I just had a conversation earlier today about um, statistics uh, in Iowa. And one of the things that is of note in Iowa is that there seems to be more um, auto bicycle collisions occurring at dusk or dawn. Um, I anticipate that this is probably due to this issue of people driving into the sun. They just can't see a thing. So um, I just I can't tell you how many calls I get about this. And it's enough that, personally, I won't do it. I do not ride into the sun in the morning or in the evening. I was out with a guy, a lawyer buddy of mine, up in uh, Cedar Rapids. And he wanted to turn into the sun at, um, in the evening, and I was just like, you got to be kidding me. You know who I am, right? You know, we're not doing this right now. It's, oh, it's only for a mile. And we ended up doing it, and I was like, oh, God. <laughs> uh, but it's normally a thing that I won't do. Now, one of the things that I suggest is bicycle clubs pay attention to this. So bicycle clubs that go out and they take, they take the same route, you know, because they like this route, pay attention to this, and if... Uh, you may want to alter or reverse your route at certain times of the year for this purpose. So um, I just, it's a very dangerous time for cyclists, especially in rural areas, because the cars are going very fast and they just don't see you. Sometimes if they attempt to avoid the collision, they apply their brakes, things like that. It's not quite as bad. This is a bad one. When people are struck, by drivers that don't see them who are driving into the sun, it's bad. As far as liability is concerned, if their defense is, the sun was in my eyes, I'm like, ka-ching. Uh, but it's not a good thing for the bicyclist. So we would, the, the overall theme of what I am trying to accomplish in my life right now is, let's have less of these problems. Like, I'm always going to be able to make a living. I would rather have less people being injured. So. Um, this is a thing that I see and I convey it to you because it's a safety issue and hopefully we can reduce that thereby. So, dogs. Anybody had any interactions with dogs in rural areas? Rabbits. <laughs> and rabbits? That's a new one. We had an alderman that had a squirrel run into his folks in Chicago. He was paralyzed or something. It was pretty bad. Yeah. Um, I think he'd been talking. Sort of yeah, it's true. He'd been, he'd been, yeah, he had a problem with squirrels before that. It was actually an ironic thing, but yeah. Um, but dogs are an issue in rural areas. Um, I've, when I was touring once in, uh, I was in Kentucky, uh, Nash, or uh, Tennessee, or something like that, right outside of, Sh I was right outside of Shiloh, Tennessee. And, um, a Doberman, and I remember just catching the movement out of the corner of my eye and thinking, this one's going fast. <laughs> um, came up and he latched onto my first aid kit, which was sort of on this exterior portion of one of my panniers, and uh, I was able to kick him loose and sort of, you know, hobble away, but when you're loaded down with that much stuff, it's, you just can't move that fast, so 
um, I almost went down, and I just remember thinking, this is going to be ugly. Um, so we have had some dog attacks. The other thing is I've, I've had some instances where dogs run into the path of a bicyclist just negligently. No, not trying to attack the bicyclist, just the owner of the dog, the person who has control of the dog, just for whatever reason doesn't have them on leash or that they get off the leash. I once had one where they were going to the dog park and they, they do things as a routine sometimes, as this person was. They go to the dog park all the time. They park in this parking lot, then they walk across the bicycle path to the dog park. And uh, she opened the door, the dog jumped out, ran over the dog park, and as he did that, ran into the bath of this bicyclist who then endowed and uh, had a actually really bad traumatic brain injury. Um, and he had no idea what happened. Very typical instance where, uh, with the head injuries, where you wake up in the hospital, you remember being about six, eight blocks, maybe you know, two minutes before the collision, and next thing you know, you wake up in the hospital and the, your family's around you, and you have no idea what happened. You just lost that time, and you never get it back, is my experience. Um, if that ever happens, by the way, very, very important. Don't let anybody know you don't remember a thing. Call a lawyer. It's time to lawyer up. You need to have somebody investigate and figure out what happened before you talk to the cops or you know anybody. Because once that goes down in a report, the insurance company is going to know he doesn't remember anything. You know how it happened? However, our guy says it happened. And that's a problem. So, Do you recommend carrying a pepper spray for a dog? Or is that illegal to do? Or, of course, if it's my dog, <laughs> I'm wondering about You know, I don't know if that's illegal or not. Um, I have. I've had some old school guys suggest to me that you carry one water bottle with an ammonia water mixture. Um, and I'm like, okay, sounds fine, because it doesn't hurt the dog, I guess, is why they like it and they bug off. Um, you don't want to drink the wrong bottle. <laughs> uh, but I, I don't know, uh, and I can't advise you as to whether or not pepper spray is illegal. My experience, with, I've carried pepper spray before for different reasons, because I used to bike, I used to commute in Chicago. Um, and my experience with pepper spray is, when you need it, you just can't get it fast enough. Uh, so it just doesn't do any good, which is why the water bottle is um, nice, I think, so. I carry it in my water bottle holder. So. Do you? Do you have like one of the, one of the uh, fire extinguisher looking ones? No, about this big around. Like a like a trigger thing on it, yeah. or is it like the push? Yeah, I don't know if that's legal or not. I've never had to use it, but I've had enough dogs that are pretty good, pretty aggressive. So. When I, I lived in Boston, yeah, when I was in um, two years ago at the um, what is it, the bike expo they have up in Des Moines. Um, I, have a, I have a booth there every year, and two years ago, it was like six, eight times during the day, somebody from uh, Fort Dodge would come up to me and tell me, and it was all the same story. Everybody in Fort Dodge is coming up to me and telling me about this dog that is the county supervisor's dog, that lives outside of town. It's apparently on this route that is a real popular route for bicyclists, and everybody's having a problem with it, but it was just hilarious. By the end of the day, I was like, tell me about the dog. What happened with the dog? Um, and then this year, anytime I met somebody from Fort Dodge, I'd be like, how's the dog? Uh, but my attitude is, you know, I think it'd be a good idea to, to mace that dog real hard. Because then when they let it into the house, you know, that's going to suck. So maybe that would um, encourage them to keep their dog under control. So I don't know. It, my, my wife is big into dogs, as I am too. Um, and um, she encourages me to discourage people from doing that because um, it's not the dog's fault. You know, it's the, it's the bad owner, usually, which I appreciate. Pepper spray the owner if they came. <laughs> yeah, the that's probably illegal. Yeah. Um, so the cool thing about dogs is um, you don't have to show intent. So if the owner of the dog simply didn't have the dog under control, 
perfect. That's all we need to show. So this is another one of these fallen off a log type of cases. Um, so the reason I say that is because I've had people call me and be like, well, the dog didn't really attack me. And it doesn't matter. Um, if they run into your path and they cause you to crash, then you know this is the formula and it's their fault. Um, so the best way in my experience, especially in Iowa, which is which strikes me as a, a place where most people try to avoid you if they can see you. Um, in Chicago, we get a lot of, um, we get a fair amount of intentional acts, to be honest. Uh, we just settled one today um, in Chicago. It's a thing in dense urban areas. My experience is in downstate Illinois and in Iowa. If people can see you, generally, they don't want to kill you. Uh, and they will try not to. There are a very visible minority of people who that doesn't apply to, and they're going to be everywhere, but uh, for the most part, um, it is not, intentional acts aren't such a problem here. So what I usually tell people is the best way to avoid being involved in a collision is to be seen. Um, and the term that I use here is conspicuity. And what I mean is, um, the art of being conspicuous. So if people can see you, they will generally avoid you. I like contrasting clothing, and I'm a big fan of, you like contrasting clothing too? Yes, just as a stylish thing. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, it's true. Um, and what I say is you can never have too many lights or reflectors. Um, never have too many. I, my bikes, I have, um, I'm a big fan of generator hubs. Um, battery powered lights, especially cheap ones in the winter, they just don't work so well, they're dim. Um, you know, it's like 15 degrees outside and your batteries will start to, your lights will start to dim. But with that generator hub, they're always crisp and very bright. Um, you don't really have to think about it. My generator hubs, I just leave the lights on all the time. Um, so you just jump on the bike and you ride and the lights are on. So it's real easy. You never have to change the batteries or anything. Um, I like for roadies who are concerned about, which I don't know if I have any hardcore roadies in here. You don't strike me as a hardcore roadie group. Um, but for me, for stylish reasons, I think reflectors are kind of dorky um, and extra stuff on your bike. I just, it's kind of the way I feel about it. So uh, I use reflective tape and I have, if you go to a contractor supply, they, you can get uh, rolls of reflective tape for 10 bucks a roll or, you know, eight bucks a roll or something. It's really cheap and it's like 15 feet. They use them on uh, uh, like big construction equipment and on, uh, semis and things like that. So I have like red and silver and yellow, got some black. But anyway, I just put it all over the bike in, in different ways. That way, um, you know, you don't, if you, if you do it stylishly, you don't notice it. It doesn't add any noticeable weight. It doesn't add any drag. It doesn't have, you know, dorky reflector written all over it like I, I think. So um, I'm a big fan of um, reflective tape. And then you can just, you know, I call it the stupid standard. When you get down the line, in, in my profession, I, prepare, I always prepare for the worst case scenario. When you get down the line, in the worst case scenario, and they're, they're, you're there on the witness stand at trial, you want to describe in great detail, you want to be able to describe in nauseating length all of the reflectors and lights that you had on your bike if your collision occurred at night. And the idea is, that this is why I call it the stupid standard. We pull out the bike, and we turn the lights down, and we flash a flashlight on it, and we turn on the lights. And the jury sees this thing, and they think, wow, this is like a clown bike. This guy must be stupid. 
this defendant that hit him, because you want them to look stupid when they say, as they all do, I didn't see you. That's right. <laughs> um, so you can never have too many lights, too many reflectors, or contrasting clothing, and it really is the best way to avoid being struck by an automobile. Um, the other thing that I always... Yeah, a, a question, or I don't know if there are any figures or any data as to whether there are more accidents at night per mile ridden on a bicycle versus day. I think there are. I don't know for sure, but I think there are. It seems like the visibility would be better at night with a bicycle with blankies and a headlight. You know, a lot visible. of people don't use them, though. Well, well, okay, but assuming that they're being used, the bicycle is quite visible. Now, that statistic, I don't know. But I do know that I get a lot of clients uh, who are struck at night, and they have great lights. I just got um, a case out of... Um, Clive, and um, the guy, I was asking him, did you have lights on? Because somebody calls me and says, I, I got hit. Uh, I've got two questions. Um, what time was it? Because I want to know if it's at night. And then, did you have a headlight? Because that's the law. And this guy's like, I can't remember what the brand was, but it was like a Lawyer Gem approved brand. Very nice. I don't remember what it was. Uh, but, you know, he paid $100. It's one of those vaporize you lights. Um, you know what I'm talking about. Something like, yeah. It's like it's got the battery with the cable that you pull off and you plug it in. I don't remember what the brand is, but I, I just remember when he told me I was familiar with it. And I, oh, wow. Um, and he got hit by a car overtaking him, and he had one of these things on the back. So it's just... You know, sometimes you can do everything right, and uh, you still have problems. But you, I think you minimize those by having bright lights. Um, I also like um, just, you just can't have too many reflectors. You just really can't. Reflective vests, just everything is good for me. Um, <clears throat> Other things to be conscious of, especially in urban areas, but pretty much everywhere, intersections, most collisions with automobiles and bicycles are intersection related. Um, if the intersection is controlled by a traffic control device, such as a stoplight, most collisions at such an intersection will occur within a few seconds of the change of lights. So, this is a very dangerous time for bicyclists, is the way I see it. Um, and before I did this for a living, um, I won the uh, 2007, uh, first fixed in the 2007 Tour to Chicago, which is an alley cat, illegal alley cat series. And um, what I say about that is my claim to fame is I can blow a light. Because um, these were races that were held on, you know, open streets with traffic and everything else. So. You know, if anybody can blow a light, I can blow a light. Since I've started doing this stuff, though, I've found I've gotten real cautious. And there's no more time in lights. Everything's, you know, coming, especially if the light is changing. Nope, we're going to wait, what happens here, and then we're going to go. Um, so, did you? Oh, not a hand. Um, so be conscious if you're approaching an intersection where there's a, there's a, a light that's about to change. Um, be conscious of that and recognize that that's a potentially dangerous situation. The collisions that come out of those, uh, those types of interactions are pretty bad. And again, if, if I see a thing that tends to see um, pretty bad collisions that have bad injuries arising from it, it's usually due to the factor of speed. So the idea is... Um, when you've got a motorist approaching a light and it's about to change red, there is a minority of people that will hit the gas so that they try to make that, that red light. Whether or not they do, when they hit the intersection, they're going very fast. Um, and so I've had 
some of my most heartbreaking cases, a couple of them that I can think of, you know, right off the top of my head, um, have occurred where the cyclist got a green light, they rolled out in the intersection, and they were mowed down by a driver who didn't make it. And it was just crushing, crushing. Those are actually the most depressing stories right there that come, have come from those cases. Um, the other situation is the driver is approaching a red light and they can see from the ambient light, ambient light from um, the, um, the adjacent roadway that they're about to get a green. And so they hit that intersection going full speed. Well, lights are timed for cars, driving at car speed. So especially if you get a situation where there's a three second yellow, like they have a lot of places, and it's a big intersection, and you've got a bicyclist that was sort of tootling along, and they, they entered the intersection on a green. It can turn to red, and the bicyclist is still in the intersection. And this is a common thing that we, that we see a lot. So the idea is, if you enter the intersection as the light turns yellow, you need to get out of the intersection uh, and be conscious of traffic around you. Because if you see, if there's somebody who's approaching and they see they're about to get the green, they may not even pay attention. This is actually one of the cool videos that I usually show um, that I, I actually may pull up. I do have it on this machine here, so I may pull it up and show it to you. Um, so what do you do? If you know you're being safe, everything, you're doing everything right, and you know sometimes worse things happens, you could you could still have a collision. Uh, my experience is if it happens in town, it's not going to be that bad. This is why I say cycling is a, is a safe way to get around because even if the people who are struck, people who are struck where the the vehicles aren't traveling more than 30 miles an hour, it just doesn't tend to be that bad. Um, speed is the Determinant factor is the, the most determinant factor is whether or not uh, catastrophic injuries are going to result from a collision, in my experience. And um, I had a client who was a science teacher, a high school science teacher, and when I told him this theory that I had, he said, you're right, and here's why. And it's the formula for kinetic energy, where uh, speed, as you increase the mass um, of an object, the energy that results from a collision with that object apparently uh, increases on a very linear level. But uh, in that equation, speed is squared. So um, I think it's energy times mass speed squared. So there you go. Velocity squared, that's right. Yeah, the mass. The if you if you increase mass, the graph looks like this. Right. If you increase velocity, because velocity is uh, is squared in that equation, it looks like this. Um, and so, the faster the car is going, the worse things tend to turn out. So, most of the time, people are hit in uh, in town. It's it's like a bump and a trip to the emergency room, and that's literally what we call those cases. What, what kind of case is this that's coming in today at three? Oh, it's a bump and a trip to the emergency room. Fine, you know, it's no big deal. Uh, we get those all day long, I'll, I'll deal with them, but uh, uh, the, the idea is it doesn't tend to be that bad in that instance. Um, in the rural areas where cars are going 55, 70 miles an hour if they're speeding, that's where you need to be real conscious of uh, what's going on around you. Uh, because if you're involved in a collision in those circumstances, then it's much more likely that you're going to be injured. And honestly, in my experience, you know, people are big on helmets. Yeah, helmets help you if you fall on the ground. You know, if you just crash, yeah, I think a helmet's helpful. If you get hit by a car going 70 miles an hour, I mean, does it do any good, you know? So maybe, depends on how you fall, I mean, I don't know. Uh, and I've had head crashes before, so I won't even go around the block without a helmet. But I'm not telling you not to wear a helmet. I'm just telling you that you just need to be cautious when the cars are going fast. And make sure that you're taking care of yourself and protecting yourself, not riding into the sun. Um, 
if you are involved in a collision, I've been there, I've been hit by cars three times, and I know how it feels. And has anybody here been hit by a car? Okay. Not what you were planning on doing that day, right? You had other stuff. You were going somewhere, right? And this is not what you wanted to deal with. And um, I think a lot of times we want to tell ourselves, uh, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, this is going to be okay. <laughs> and, you know, I got a busted knee and I end up trying to pedal away from it. I had a buddy who was doored and um, he had a broken hand and he, rah, and he screamed at the guy who doored him and then he got on his bike and he rode off and he got, you know, a quarter mile down the road and realized, oh, I have a broken hand. I have to go back and talk to this guy now and get his, you know, get his insurance information, and call the police and, you know, fill out the report. He just screamed at him. Um, so it was uncomfortable. Um, but what I say is recognize this is a thing you have to deal with now. I get a lot of calls from people who didn't do things right from the very beginning. And forget about, you know, my job is to take care of the financial aspects of things for my clients a lot of times. Most of the time, that's the, if you boil it down, that's the simple aspect of my job. But what happens is when you're involved in a collision, your adrenaline is pumping. You, you really, you can't tell what's going on with your body, which is why I had a messed up knee, my buddy had a broken hand. Just I could go through a laundry list of clients who have done this where um, they think, I'm fine, it's, it's cool, it's cool, it's cool, I'm just going to ride off. And uh, they, they don't get any information, they don't file a police report, nothing happens, and then they end up screwed. Um, because they've got a problem, once the adrenaline wears off, they realize they've got a problem, then they have to go to the hospital and, you know, problems ensue from there. So the idea is, if a collision occurs, fine, deal with this. Um, you need to call the police, you need to get a police report. Uh, that's for your protection as much as, you know, the motorists or anything else. Uh, even if it's you know, your fault, that you, you want to stick around and just deal with it. Fleeing the scene is just a bad thing for anybody. If you just stop, no matter what happens, if you just stop, unless you're drunk, uh, and you're driving a car, and then, then you got a problem. Um, but if you're sober, just if you stop, even if you killed a person, they're not going to do anything to you. I mean, really, they're not going to do anything to you. And this is one of the big problems we have in Iowa, is you can just kill a person, um, and it's just no problem, <laughs> as, long as, you're, as long as you're not drunk, you know? Uh, kill somebody off, give them a bicycle as a gift. Yeah. That's what I used to say. I was, you know, you, you, somebody decides, because I used to get calls from people, like, you know, suing people, they don't like it. Um, and once in a while, it hasn't happened in a long time, so I probably do now, but once in a while I get a call, you know, watch your back. Um, it's whatever. Um, but um, what, I, what I would say to that is, like, you know, you want to kill me? You know, come down and wait down at the end of the block from my house, you know, just mow me down someday when I'm on my way to work, you know, and nobody's going to say a word about it. Um, but that's the reality of the situation. So if, if, you, if something happens, just stop and deal with it as a bicyclist or a driver or whatever. Let's just stop, treat this as a business transaction now and deal with it. As the cyclist, um, I always say, just take the ambulance ride. Take the ambulance ride to the hospital. Make sure you get checked out if there's any possibility of being injured. Now, I've, had, I've been hit by a car once, and I, I just knew I was fine. I knew 100% for sure I was fine, and yeah, I was fine. Okay, you don't need to take the ambulance ride. But if there is any possibility that you are injured, just take the ambulance ride. Let, go to the hospital. Let them check you out. As I've stated many times, my job is to prepare for the worst-case scenario and to advise people accordingly. Um, what happens is this. Oh, so you ended up with a broken arm, huh? Well, tell me, did the police respond to the collision with my client? And the guy says, yeah. Oh, oh, okay. And um, 
when the police responded, they asked you if you needed an ambulance, right? Oh yes, as a matter of fact, they did. And when they asked you if you needed the ambulance, you refused that ambulance. You told them you didn't need an ambulance. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I did. Um, and, and then you end up with this broken arm. You know, well, this isn't our fault. You know, he fell down the stairs. Somebody else hit him with the car, but this isn't our fault because if it was our fault, he would have gone to the hospital, the ambulance. Uh, and believe it or not, regardless of the injuries, the statistics show that awards for plaintiffs in instances where they take an ambulance ride is actually higher than instances where they don't, given the same set of circumstances. As weird as that is, but it's just true. Even if they go to the emergency room the same day. So it's this really bizarre thing that is a fact. Um, but the idea is you can't tell what's going on with your body. Sometimes, and it's just a thing that I see so much that it, this is why I talk about it. Um, just go have them check you out. They're professionals. I have pain in this area. They're going to figure out whether or not there's a problem, and then you can go on from there. Um, I always say it's a good idea if you know to follow up with your doctor, uh, your regular doctor, after you go to the emergency room. You know, take a few days. Um, what we see a lot of times in bicycle cases is injuries to things that we fall on, typically joints. So this is common things are um, wrists or elbows, um, shoulders, knees, hips. Um, these are the common things that we see as far as the structure of the body being injured. Um, it's different from other types of collisions, you know, auto accidents or other things that you see because uh, just so much the injuries tend to be to the joints that we fall on. Sometimes because of the nature of the injury, um, you don't notice immediately. And I think also, I think bicyclists, being people who are active and healthy, uh, sometimes we have a hard time being honest with ourselves about whether or not we're in fact injured. I don't sit around eating potato chips all day. So if I got a thing with my knee, you know, I notice it. And I don't really want to face facts with that. And right now I actually have a messed up ankle and I am denying it myself. Um, it's fine. But it's, it's just a thing that we do. Um, so be honest with yourself. Take the ambulance ride. Follow up with your doctor. If you end up with a problem down the line, then at least we've got these two dots that we can connect back to the date of the accident. So if we need to, we can get insurance to pay for it. Um, I think... One of the things I've noticed about people in Iowa is that Iowans are not litigious. Um, they really don't want to sue each other out here. And I think part of the reason for that is, especially in rural areas, oh, I got hit by Joe who lives down the road and I don't want to sue him, so they don't call me. Or they call me and they tell me they don't, you know, it's, it's just, it's, I've got a girl out of, I can't remember, I think it's Ankeny that's called me like three times. She's got really bad injuries and she's messing everything up and she just doesn't want me to deal with it. She just wants to call me and ask for advice after she's messed everything up. And, um, and I, I'm fine with that. I, I want to be able to tell people how to do it right even if they don't hire me. But at the same time, it's this frustrating situation because I'm trying to convey to her, just because you hire me doesn't mean we're gonna run out and sue a person. You know, I, most of my cases resolve amicably before a suit is filed. And I don't mean like most, like 60%. I mean like 80%. Um, and my attitude is it's easier on everybody. The client gets the money faster if we just sit down and agree on things. Now, I'm going to tell you it's just not always going to happen. There are times when, you know, you think just because you know, an insurance company is out there that they're going to be noble and good to you? No. That's just not always going to be the case. I don't care what anybody says. Sometimes I get people from the industry in here and, you know, they want to act like they know probably better than anybody because I used to be a defense attorney, so I knew as well. Um, insurance companies just aren't always going to be fair to you. And sometimes that may be due to their insured. Regardless of how the insurance company feels about the case, some insurance companies, if their insured says to them, this is not my fault, they will defend on that basis alone. 
So um, even if the insurance company is trying to be fair, they may be trying to be fair to their insured who is saying, this is not my fault. And on that basis, they will then deny your claim and, and dispute the case, and then you have to, worst case scenario, now you got to call me. Um, I tell people there are basically when you should think about calling me is if there's an injury. If it's just a case where you're bumped up and your bike is damaged, which is a common thing, another thing, like I say bicycling is a very safe thing to do, a very common collision that I get calls about is, uh, I'm fine, my bicycle was damaged. No problem. I'll tell you how to deal with that. You can give me a call. You don't necessarily need to hire an attorney to deal with that, and it's probably not worth it, even if you had a $5,000 carbon fiber, blah, 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 blah. Last year, we broke our record for property damage claims for bicycles. Uh, the year before, it was $15,000. Last year, we had a $19,000 bicycle. So um, they can get expensive. At the same time, it's, you know, however much your bicycle costs, it's not worth it for me to sue somebody over your bicycle. I have done it, uh, but not only is it not worth it for me, but the system is set up so that you could basically do it on your own. So I kind of walk people through that process, unless I feel like they're not being dealt with fairly. Uh, but most of the time, if it's just property damage, you don't need to hire a lawyer. Okay, so what about if it's, you're injured, but you're not injured related to another bicycle or another auto, but it's related to, you know, you got attacked by the goose when you're going around, um, or you, uh, you know... You is this a thing? <laughs> the goose? Seriously, a goose attacked her when we were out riding together and she ended up in the hospital, uh, or... or or you're riding along and your bike tire goes into something in the road, and so it's related Well, to defects in roadways are their own thing. Um, you know, if somebody has a problem with a defect in a roadway, you can call me, and it sort of depends on the situation as to whether or not there's a thing that we can do. Um, if this is just a wild goose that's just wild and not owned by a person, uh, then that sounds like a pretty tough situation unless there's some... There has to be some theory, unless the goose had insurance. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, that, that sounds like a tough one to me. How, how badly were you injured from the goose? Oh, just um, cracked ribs and goose. That's bad. Ribs, ribs suck. I've had broken ribs. That's awful. I was in the hospital for parts of three days. Yeah. I think I'd have a hard time making a case out of that. Oh, wow. That's tough. I'm sorry. Well, it's, you know, all these ponds around here in town have all kinds of geese on them. And this particular time of year is really bad because they're trying to protect their young. So that's why they're so aggressive when they come out after. And so the key is you're not going to look them in the eye. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I don't think there's much to be done with that. If you're struck by... Pepper spray. Pepper spray. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, if you're struck by a, a car, if there's a car involved, even if the person drives off or it's your fault, um, the med pay, does everybody in here actually own a car? I remember you don't. It, so anybody who doesn't own a car. So everybody, go ahead. Do not own a car. You don't own a car? It's noble. Um, here's why it sucks. You actually would be smart to have auto insurance um, because people who own cars have uninsured, underinsured, and medical payments provisions under their auto policy. I know this is riveting stuff here. Um, but this is actually an important thing that I would talk about for people who don't have cars. And one of the things that I suggest is, um, here's the deal. If you're struck by a person and you, you break an arm and they only have $20,000 in insurance coverage, is that going to cover it? I don't know. Can you break your arm for 20 Gs? I don't know. But the idea is they could hurt you a lot worse than that. And then where do you get your money from? How do you get your medical paid for? You know, Even if you have insurance, you're going to have other costs. You can miss time from work. It could create problems with your studies, You know, put you out of school for a semester, you know, cause other problems. Um, and these are all things that you would be entitled to compensation for if there was some insurance policy that attached to that. Of course, if the driver only has a $20,000 insurance policy, 
what house do you think they're going home to? You know, can you go after their personal assets? No. You know, it's generally people with assets are going to have insurance to protect their assets. I know it's riveting stuff. Um, insurance, everybody starts yawning at insurance. Uh, but it's actually really important stuff, and it's a big part of my practice, uh, is finding sources of insurance coverage. So what I tell people who don't have a car, you're not going to get the benefit of that coverage if somebody who doesn't have enough insurance strikes you and injures you badly, or if they flee the scene. If somebody flees the scene and they get away, they are never found, I can still effectuate a recovery for everybody in here except for you. Because they have auto coverage that is activated by the fact that they are struck by an automobile. Not by the fact that you're driving your car, but by the fact that you're struck by an automobile. So if you are a pedestrian, if you are riding your bicycle, or if you're driving your car and someone hits you and they flee the scene or they do not have insurance, I can still effectuate a recovery for you under your own policy, and it's a no-fault claim. So better yet, they can't even raise your rates for it because it's somebody else's fault. Um, you, on the other hand, have a problem. So whenever the legislature considers raising the mandatory minimum limits of insurance, I always ask for the opportunity to come down and talk about people like you because I see you in my practice. And what I say is, Bicyclists and pedestrians who do not own cars are at special risk for uninsured drivers or underinsured drivers. And here's why. If they get struck by somebody like that and they're injured, what do they do? They're out of luck. And most legislatures don't actually care about this problem because normal people drive cars and normal people have auto insurance. And if they don't have enough auto insurance, well, that's their own problem. And that was a decision that they made, but not you. You guys are special. So that's why I make this argument in front of legislatures every, ch every chance I get. Um, and it's in favor of raising mandatory minimum limits of um, auto coverage. Here's what I suggest for people like you. You should think about getting a non-owner's auto policy or an operator's policy. Um, Safeco writes them, Progressive writes them. Not every insurance company writes them. And if you talk to a broker, he, that person might be might be a little dim and might not get the, the idea of why you would want this coverage. But I will tell you, it costs about the same as, uh, do you ever rent a car? No. Oh, well, then this isn't good. But if, you, if you ever rent a car, they ask you to pay for insurance coverage on the car. If you rent a car twice a year, it'll pay for itself, basically, because you can then decline the insurance coverage on the car. So this is the other argument I make. But you should think about this coverage. Um, it's not expensive. It's like, I don't, I don't know what it is. You know, it depends on a number of factors. But it's compared to other types of insurance, it's actually really cheap because you don't actually own a car. So the, the risk is low to the insurance company. So um, I always suggest car-free bicyclists. You want to get it for the underinsured and uninsured motorist coverage. That way, if somebody strikes you, you're still in control of being able to effectuate a recovery if you need to. And I've seen people's lives change because of underinsured drivers. Um, and um, then they, they turn around. They all do the same thing when I tell them, OK, this is all we can get for you because of the limitations of the insurance coverage. Um, they do the same thing every time. They go through, but blah, 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 blah. And they tell me how awful their recovery has been and all their injuries and everything else, and I say, be that as it may, this is the money that is available for you to, re to recover. Um, you know, we could go sue the driver. The costs for that suit come out of the money that we can recover. What do we get when we sue the driver that has no assets? I have a $120,000 judgment against a guy that I got seven years ago. He works at a T-Mobile kiosk in the middle of a, of a uh, mall, and when am I going to see that money? I mean, I haven't seen any of it. So, you know, when we get down to it, sometimes the question is, where can you get the money from? Um, so I always tell people, if you, if you feel like Iowans, I get it, you don't like to sue your neighbors, you know, you don't want to be litigious, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. 
But if you feel like, oh, I, I didn't want to get a lawyer involved. And I get these phone calls from people. It's like, oh, man, am I that smarmy? Is that what it is? Like, I'm a smarmy lawyer, and now the insurance company is screwing you, so now you're going to call me? Um, and I take it personally, which I probably shouldn't, because it's just a, it's a thing. Um, but the idea is, if you think just because you don't have a lawyer, that there's no lawyer involved with this transaction with an insurance company, that's right. That's right. It's funny because uh, they got armies of these guys, and I used to be one of them. So I know how it works. You know, we would train the adjusters and how to deal with people. Um, so I always tell people, if you think just because you don't have a lawyer, there's no lawyer involved, that's that's obviously an illusion. Um, and I always just like it when people give me a call. You know, even if you don't want me to hire you, like this girl out of. Ankeny, it's, it's fine. You know, I'll walk you through it. Let's just see that you get it done right, even though, you know, it's tend to mess it up. What I see more than anything with people who don't get lawyers and they handle their own claims, they don't get as much money. And the two mistakes that they make generally that are really bad mistakes, and this is why I say you should have somebody deal with this for you who knows what they're doing. Besides the service that they provide of not having to deal with the insurance company and everything else that's so irritating. If you are struck and your health insurance pays out on a claim, your claim against the defendant driver is not actually just for your out-of-pocket expenses. Because if you settle with the insurance company for just your out-of-pocket expenses, your health insurance company paid out on your loss, they can turn around. I know it's. I get it. I get it. <laughs> um, your insurance company can. Your health insurance company can actually turn around you and say. Uh, where's our cut? Because you actually have an obligation, if you make a claim against the driver, to recover on behalf of your health insurance company that paid out. Your health insurance company contracts with you to provide for your health insurance needs, your health care costs, right? But dumb driver hits you? Well, that's not, that's not what they contracted for. That's dumb driver's fault. Now, they can't sue dumb driver personally. But if you make a claim against dumb driver, you have to take your insurance company into consideration, and you have to re reimburse them. So your claim for, to, against dumb driver is not just for your out-of-pocket expenses, but it's for all expenses incurred. And this is a thing called the collateral source rule. It's a thing in, in law. Uh, and what it basically says is a tortfeasor is not entitled to the benefits of payments that other people have made on your behalf. We're getting to close to 830. We need to be hoping you talk about Legislative stuff. It is what it is and how much You're just it sick of the insurance. Is that what it is? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, what did you want me to talk about? Well, you know, the bike coalition went in with a bunch of the, with a new lobbying firm and a whole bunch of ideas about what can we do to, do to get laws passed, and then we ended up with a so better better no texting law, basically. Is it. Well. So I called Mark last year of the Iowa Bicycle Coalition, and I, I said, what's going on with the legislative agenda? And maybe it was two years ago. I don't remember. But um, um, I said, well, how much do you have in your lobbying budget? And it was like $3,000. It was ridiculous. It was nothing. And I said, well, let's do something about that. And so I threw a bunch of money at him. And we did a matching thing where um, if you donated to uh, the lobbying effort for the Iowa Bicycle Coalition, Lawyer Jim will match your contribution up to blah, blah, blah. And uh, we ended up raising, I think it was twenty twenty-five thousand dollars $25,000 this year. So we had a lot of money to work with this year. My big thing is change lanes to pass. And it is my position that this is actually the existing law in Iowa that if you overtake a bicyclist, that bicyclist is a vehicle, and you are required to change lanes in order to pass that bicyclist. And that's my position. Now, the problem that we've run into is that um, there are some redneck judges out there that disagree. And that's just, I'm just going to call it like I see it. Um, but uh, we have had some bad calls, in my opinion. And um, so, my big thing was, uh, let's get change lanes to pass, codified and clarified that this applies to bicyclists. And really, that's all we're trying to do. 
This applies to vehicles, including bicycles. I'd be happy with that. Um, and that uh, met Republican res resistance and was not passed. So um, we didn't make it with the change lanes to pass. And they tabled that. They're going to deal with it this summer. There's a possibility it still may go through. But they wanted to hook in all this other stuff that bicycles are required to have lights during the daytime, uh, that bicycles are required to have reflective vests. Uh, at all times, you know, just weird stuff that clearly is designed to protect motorists who would be otherwise negligent and strike a bicyclist. Then they've got this defense they can use. Oh, it was 3 o'clock in the afternoon, but they didn't have their headlight. It's a per se uh, violation of a statute, and so it's, it's per se negligence. Um, evidence of negligence because of the violation of the statute. So... We gave all that stuff a thumbs down, and uh, we're unable to reach an agreement on the change lanes to pass, so that's been sort of thrown on the back burner. We're going to try again next year on that. What they did accomplish was texting is now basically treated like driving drunk. So if you kill a bicyclist uh, and you're texting, um, it's a class three felony. So that was a thing, and I was happy with that. Um, does it change things? I don't know. I guess we'll see. It's also a primary. It's primary offense. Not secondary. Um, and that's another thing. It's like, a, does it change much? I don't know. Yeah, I do too. I do too. I think I did. Hit the cyclist in West Liberty was charged with the felony. Was he the one? I don't know. Has it been used yet? Is that what you're saying? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. It came, I can't remember. If you see it, send it to me. Yeah. I'd be interested to know. Um, so that was accomplished. Uh, and the idea is the, um, you know, texting, what I say about it is, tech, is using your phone. Studies show that using your phone while you're driving is basically the same impairment as driving drunk. Um, when I talked to Mark about it, um, he, what he had to say to me is, you're right. And it's also similar in that you make a conscious choice to do a thing. So you make a choice to drive drunk. You make a choice to text as you're driving. And uh, so for those reasons, we, you know, we feel like it's, it's good that they sister texting with uh, driving drunk. Uh, and that's a, that's a good thing. You know, I like Iowa because I feel like a lot of other jurisdictions have a lot of laws that apply to bicyclists. And in Iowa, they just kind of treat them as cars. Um, and there just aren't a lot of laws. Um, and I like that it's not muddled. Um, and that's a good thing. So as we proceed, people come to me sometimes and they think, we need this law, we need that law. A lot of times, I don't think we need that stuff. One of the big examples is, uh, we need a helmet law. I want to see a helmet law, and this is for safety reasons. Here's my thing. Anybody here know anybody who's ever gotten a ticket on a bicycle? On a bicycle. Anybody? No. Not one. And we just have a few people in here. But I'm going to tell you, I ask this question every presentation I give, ever. And only one time did I have a guy raise his hand. And I asked him about it, and it turns out the guy just got a warning. Um, so we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of people that I've talked to over the years. No one ever has heard of a person getting a headlight ticket. Now, I know that there are some small towns that, um, that actually law enforcement has nothing better to do, and they will give out a ticket for not having a headlight at night, uh, because I grew up in one such small town in downstate Illinois. Um, and I have been told that there are some communities here in Iowa where they, where they will do that, although the guy didn't know. Um, but I, I believe it. You know, you got a small town with cops with nothing better to do. I'll, I'll bet that they give, you know, high school kids tickets for not having their, their lights. But the idea is this. In the absence of enforcement, what's the motivation to comply with the law? And you just see a lot of people that don't. So here in Iowa City, you see a lot of people riding around from time to time without headlights, right? And you've got all these great street lights. What do they need them for? You know, I can see. What do I need it for? So if people don't get tickets, when is this law used? It's used when an otherwise negligent motorist 
wants to defend themselves against a bicyclist. So here we have this law that on the face of it, you would think is a safety thing for bicycles, and it ends up being a shield that the motorists use against them. So helmet laws, I see the same thing. So when I say about helmets, and I don't ride around the block with that helmet, uh, but at the same time, I don't think we need that law because then we end up in a situation where, oh, he's got a head injury, he didn't have a helmet. If it weren't for that lack of helmet, he wouldn't have a head injury, and I should just be going home now. Um, so I don't like the idea of giving motorists more defenses to use. And this is an issue that we can deal with through education um, and other means. So I, I give helmet laws and more headlight laws. And this was actually one of the things that came up with the change lanes to pass. They wanted to add uh, a provision. Okay, we'll give you change lanes to pass, but we want uh, a requirement for... Um, rear tail light and I was like bummer uh, because why do they why do the Republicans want that well they want it for the same reason they want the requirement for a reflective vest or riding your lights during the day if they were and they say oh no this is a safety issue we're concerned about bicyclist safety if that was really true they do like Deerfield Illinois does Deerfield Illinois has a helmet law for minors but the law also says, if you strike a minor, you cannot use non-compliance of this law as a defense against them. And here, we suggested that, and it was like a no-go with the Republicans. So, okay, let's, not, let's, not, let's be honest, though. We're not talking about safety here. We're talking about protecting insurance companies and protecting otherwise negligent motorists and blaming the victim. And that's the way I see it. So that's why, and I've had to explain this before, because... The Iowa Bicycle Coalition got heat for, uh, from members for opposing the red light tail light. And I was basically you know, one of the guys that was making the call on that. And I'm like, anybody gives you a hard time on this, you have them call me because I will explain to them why it's a bad idea for us. And I'm not, you know, I'm just trying to do the right thing for my client base, you know. And I figure if, if this is a really a safety issue, then yeah. Let's give people fines. I don't care if you give people tickets and fines for not having lights, but I don't think you're going to do it. And I don't want to include that, that possibility of otherwise negligent motors being able to use it as a defense. So anybody have any other questions? What about insurance adjusters? What about them? They've always said they were talking about um, it. It's true. That's one of the mistakes. So people make... I would talk about the mistakes that people make when they try to handle it on their own. One is they usually give a recorded statement. Um, and this is what happened. The, you call the insurance company. Oh, it's the first thing I got to do. I got to call the insurance company. They're insured hit me. Well, you don't have any obligation to call the insurance company. And what are you going to talk to them about? You know, even if I represent you, if you come in and you sign up with me and I say, okay, I'm going to take your case and I represent you, I put the, that insurance company on notice that I represent you, basically so they can't contact you. Once you are represented by counsel, the insurance company has to legally, they have to deal with your counsel. They cannot contact you directly. Um, and that's the way we want it because I do this, you know, eight hours a day, you know, five days a week, 17 years. Uh, so I know what I'm doing. And um, the person who, oh, just got hit for their first time, they don't know what the heck they're doing. And they always mess it up. But one of the things that they commonly do is they call up the insurance company immediately after they're hit, and they say, your insured hit me. And the insurance company does this. Oh, I'm so sorry. Well, would you like to give a recorded statement? And they act like it's a thing you're going to do to help yourself out. And so if I ever get a call from a defendant, I do the same thing. Oh, oh, I'm so sorry we're wrong, wrongfully suing you. Oh, would you like to give a recorded statement? And what do they want that statement for? Recorded. They don't need it recorded. You can just tell them what you want, you know, what, what happened. They don't have to record it. They want to record it, and I want to record the defendant's statement. Because later on down the road, when we get to trial, I want to pull that out and use that against them to suggest that they are, they have changed their testimony or the, the other nice thing is when they give the recorded statement, you generally don't have the benefit of counsel. So you mess things up. You talk about things that you otherwise would not, you volunteer at least. Um, 
or you phrase things incorrectly or you, do, you make other mistakes. Um, so the idea is they want to use that. They're preparing their defense from the moment they start that recorded statement. That's what they're really trying to do because you could just tell them. So what I say is I've never seen an instance where a recorded statement has helped a person, but I've seen time and time and time again where it's been used against them down the road. So um, another situation where I just try to tell people, you know, just call me and just talk to me about it. Even if you don't want you know, to sue your neighbor Joe or you've got other issues with lawyers or whatever, clearly I'm not a stuffed shirt guy, lawyer. I'm not a stuffed shirt lawyer. I'm just some guy who does this thing, and I'm really trying to help people out and in more ways than just you know, this is how I put bread on my table, but at the same time, um, you know, you go see some other lawyer. He's just, all he looks at is the number on your case. Um, you know, I'm trying to give back and support this community that um, I relate to for my own personal reasons uh, and because of my love of the bicycle and, you know, use of it over the, the years and years and years and years and years and my shared experience with people. Um, whereas other guys, they just don't have that connection. You know, you go into their office and they're like, these are the dollar signs that I see in your case. And, you know, for me, it's let's, let's see that somebody's treated fairly and what can we do to, 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 to make things better, which is why a portion of our proceeds are donated to charities and such. So this, this request for a recorded statement, and it's your right, your prerogative, you can say, I'll make a statement, but I do not want that recorded. You can do that. Is that the best thing to do? And then well, record it anyway, but it can't be used. Uh, no, they're not going to record it if you don't. If you don't authorize them to, they won't do it. Um, but you know, here's the deal. What are you going to talk to them about after you just had your collision and you're still treating? Like, what are you going to talk to them about? Tell them what happened. And and for what reason? Because here's the thing. Really, when you start talking, when I start talking to the insurance company, we're going to talk about what is the value of this case? Because that is the question that I am hired to address. And that is the question that the insurance company has contracted to address. So when we get down to it, this is the one question that matters to them. What's the value of this claim? And if you're still treating, and you haven't finished, and you haven't recovered, and you don't know how the, the future of your life is going to be affected, by this, this injury that you sustained, mm -hmm. what do we have to talk to them about? Nothing. Nothing. I give them no information at that point, even if I represent a person. And I do hilarious things. I think, I think it's hilarious. It's, I love dealing with insurance companies at this point because they call me up and they want all this information. And I give them squat. And I always do the same thing. I say, oh, um, I, you know, can you tell me your policy limits? And this is kind of a pimp because they always say, no, I can't tell you my policy limits until I have all the medical and all this other information and, you know, get all this. And I would say, oh, 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 I'm so sorry. Uh, I can't help you out then. It's just firm policy. You know, <laughs> I act like somebody's over me. But the idea is this, what this does is this twists that adjuster in knots because his job at that moment is to set his reserves to figure out how much the potential value of this claim is so that he can set money aside for it so that he's in get, he doesn't get fired later on when they haven't reserved enough money for your claim. Um, so a lot of times, you know, and the only, they can give me the policy information. What's, is this a mandatory minimum limits policy? Is this a $100,000 policy? Is it a $250,000? Is it a million dollar policy? They won't tell me at that stage. And so I always do the same thing where I'm like, sorry, I'm not, I, I, firm policy. You don't have to tell me the policy. I can't tell you anything about the case. Um, and, you know, a lot of times, about two out of three times, at that moment, they'll be like, oh, this is a $50,000 policy. Oh, okay, well, now we, I'll give you the information you need. 